about this bright sunny day we have out there amen. that's a big amen amen well we're glad to see everybody hope you've had a good week and uh hope you're here to just enjoy the lord today amen, amen. that's why we're here so let's uh we're going to sing uh, an old song here me and dan and i think everybody know the words if you want to join in you just help us okay From your burden of sin There's power in the blood Power in the blood Would you or evil A victory win There's wonderful power In the blood There is power Power, power, power Wonder working power In the blood Of the Lamb There is power Power, power Wonder working power precious blood of the Lamb. brighter than snow there's power in the blood power in the blood since things are lost in its life-giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood there is power 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 wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power In the precious blood of the Lamb, would you be free? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you come evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood. In the precious blood of the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer each day, dear Lord, to do the best I can. For I need thy life to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, oh my hand. Jesus, oh my hand. I Protect me by 
Let me travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy that and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and firmly take a stand as I onward go and daily meet the flow. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. Page 223, Victory in Jesus. Page 223, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story. 
Amen. I want you to sing with me now. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. Plunge me to victory beneath the crimson flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Let's stand as we sing on that last verse. I heard about a mansion. Yes, sir. Amen. Singing. I heard about a mansion. He is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold. Beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Singing! All right, you know, today we have two special guests with us I'd like to recognize today. And they are dear to my heart. Met them several years ago down in Hinesdale. And it's Pastor Bill Williams and his wife, Wilma Williams. Let's give them a hand today. Uh, brother, uh, I was not going to say anything to you because I knew that you would sit there in your seat and worry about this until the time came. So I want you to come up front here for just a minute. Come on up here. <laughs> Watch him act like he's bashful. He's a preacher. <laughs> Come on up here. This fella here is, a, is just a tremendous guy. And uh, brother, I want you to tell the folks what you shared with me about your ministry out there and how, where you started and where you're at today. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Well, <clears throat> I was the pastor at the Mount Olivet Church for uh, 32 and a half years. Retired from out there and I decided that I didn't uh, didn't really want another full-time church for a while. But anyway, we had some good friends that were in Martinsville that had relation in the Eminence Baptist Church. Their uh, pastor had been there 35 years and unfortunately had a stroke and wasn't able to continue with the pastorate. So they asked Wilma and I if we would come up and fill in and help them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said, sure, we'll be glad to. 
but I don't think I want a full-time church right now. But we went up, well, one thing led to another, and the first thing you know, it got up into November. Thanksgiving's getting close, Christmas is getting close, so I told them, I said, I will uh, be more than happy to help you, uh, but you be looking. Well, that time came, and I told them, I said, I'll stay with you through Thanksgiving, Christmas, the first of the year, but be looking. Well, everything went fine, but well, when I was going up to church one Sunday morning and was talking about the scenery and different things, and uh, some voice that kind of has a way of touching people once in a while called the good Lord said, Bill, we're done looking. So we've been the pastor up there for going on three years. This is the first Sunday we had off, and I thought we would come up and agitate Tim this morning. So... <laughs> But nevertheless, I do want to glorify God. I have done nothing. I've done nothing. But that church, when we went to eminence because of the absence of the pastor and whatever, uh, most Sundays was down around 9 to 11 people. Today, to the glory of God, if we get everybody there, they're not in Gatlinburg or somewhere like that, we're averaging right close to the mid-50s. And... And the best, the best thing about that is when we went there, our youngest member was a college girl. <laughs> Two weeks ago, if they, we had three kids that were not there that are regulars. If they would have been there, Wilma would have had 14 kids in the kids' church. So we want to thank God. And I want to say this very quickly. He's been a big inspiration to me, big help. He's preached a revival down at Eminence one time. So I want to tell you how happy, thankful, and blessed Wilma and I are to be back to visit with you today. We visited out at the other church a number of times. And I want to tell you just how much I thank God that he allowed Tim Roller and my path to cross. Tim, it's a pleasure. God bless you. Amen. Bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Well, that's a great story, isn't it? God is so good, and God is still working, isn't he? Amen. Brother Phil Morgan, can you come up here for just a minute, please? You got to hurry now. We're on the clock. We're on the clock. Okay, I want you to stand right there. Right there. Yeah. Right can you give him your microphone for just sure. a minute? Now, today's a special day for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. So I'd like for you to tell the folks, just like you said at the nursing home yesterday, about your mama. Okay. <laughs> My mom would have been 103 years old uh, today. And uh, my mom loved uh, I'll Fly Away. And uh, when, uh, when mom would play the organ at the church, she would, uh, I guess you want me to do that's this That's what too. I want you to do. That's, <laughs> what I, that's what I figured. Anyhow, she would really make that pedal go, go back and, uh, and forth on the, uh, on, on the organ. Everybody used to talk about, about her and how she, she loved playing the organ. So anyhow, uh, yesterday actually uh, I, I sang uh, I'll Fly Away in, uh, in her memory because today would have been her uh, 103rd birthday. And I'm also going to say uh, I'll Fly Away also was uh, Brother Tim's mother's 
uh, favorite uh, uh, song also. But uh, Mom even wanted that to uh, sing uh, at her uh, funeral, because she loved all fly away. Amen. So, uh, so anyhow, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. 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 So in honor of Miss Lola's uh, birthday. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. Don't you know heaven is rejoicing this morning? Yeah. Amen. Because you know why? Everybody then flew away and they're there. Amen. Well, <laughs> glory to God. All right, Brother Mark. Once I stood in the night with my head bowed low in the darkness as black as the sea and my heart was afraid and I cried oh Lord don't hide your face from me hold my hand all the way every hour every day from here to the great unknown take a king I may live in a mansion so tall with great riches to call my own but I don't know a thing in this whole wide world that's worse than being alone hold my hand Great I 
Yes, amen. Where no one stands alone. Blessed rock of ages, trust in now, dear Lord, in thee. Keep me till my journey is ended. Keep me till thy face I see. Rock of ages, till thy blessed face I see. When the storms around me rage, rock of ages, hide the me. Some lawyers can win, and a doctor can heal. Your old banker can live till all your pockets are filled. But if yours is a case of a strength trick in the soul for the problem you face. There's only one place to go. Just climb up that mountain where still springs a fountain that sparkling crimson called Calvary's flow. That same Jesus you heard of can take a black heart without love. Wash it in red blood and make it whiter than snow. Don't gamble on life with all your luck and your skill. Cause you can't play the card that death's gonna deal. For the Bible has planned who the loser's gonna be there's only two winning hands and they were nailed to 
a tree Just climb up that mountain Where still springs a fountain That sparkling crimson Called Calvary's flow That thing Jesus you heard of Can take a black heart without love Wash it in red blood And make it whiter than yes. snow That same Jesus you heard of Can take a black heart without love Wash it in red blood And make it whiter than snow book of Titus chapter number 3. I want to just read some passages here and then we'll move on. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, everybody say that with me, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, I like what chapter 2 verse 1 says. It says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Amen? Yeah. Skip on down to verse number 11. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Say those first two words with me. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Do you see what grace does? Do you see what grace does? Grace, it is grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness. Amen? You get your list of rules out from here up to here and over to here to here and up to here to down to there. You get that list of rules out, you won't keep one of them. You will eventually break them. It takes the grace of God and nothing less, ladies and gentlemen, to teach us to how to live godly lives. Amen? If you go back to the book of Jonah with me for just a moment, the book of Jonah, chapter number one, chapter number one, book of Jonah. Say amen if you're there got enough to start. Amen. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord, Ray look at me, <clears throat> now the word of the Lord uh, came unto Jonah the son of Amitia, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down to it to go with them to unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's just stop there and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Father, thank you that everybody is here that's here today. We pray for those who wanted to be here, desired to be here, that, that, but they just can't. And Father, I pray that you'll bless them today. Watch over them, protect them. Father, I pray that in this hour you have blessed me. Let me be a blessing to your people. And I pray you teach us something here today, Father, we all need to hear. And I'll thank you for that, Father. And if there's one in our midst or in our listening audience today, uh, Father, by video, if they are not saved, we pray that today would be the day and the hour they would trust you as their Lord and Savior. And I ask all of this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Well, this past week... I listened to a pastor friend of mine that I grew up with talking about his experience of going to Bible college over 50 years ago. <laughs> he mentioned something that kind of got my attention, though. He said he knew nothing of the Bible. 
So when he got saved, his pastor advised him that he should go to Bible college. He said as he sat there in one of his first classes, he sat there and he heard the story of Jonah for the very first time in his whole life. <laughs> now this didn't surprise me a great deal because as we were growing up together, he and his family, they were not involved in church. They just had nothing to do with church at all. But eventually at the age of 18, he was saved on a Sunday morning, glory to God. And soon after that, he was called to the ministry and that's when his journey began. Now I would hope that everybody in this room today has heard this story about uh, the story of Jonah. Uh, if you have, it's going to make my preaching just a little bit easier today. You'll be able to follow me. But if not, well, you'll learn something here, I hope, like the rest of us. But over the years, I have heard plenty of sermons. Raise your hand if you've ever heard a sermon about Jonah. Amen. Okay. So we've all heard plenty of sermons from the preachers uh, that preached about a, a, a prophet that ran from God. So I think I remember one preacher naming his sermon, God Always Gets His Man. And you know what? God did get Jonah in the end, didn't he? Amen? So that's, that was a good title. So let's get into this message today, and I hope we'll see some things that will be a blessing for all of us today. As we opened up in the book of Jonah here, the first words that popped out was, the word of the Lord came unto him. So uh, the word of the Lord now has come to Jonah. Jonah is the son of Amittai, and his father's name means my truth. Now, wouldn't it be nice if your daddy's name meant my truth? That must have meant he was a fellow that was always going to tell the truth, like Dan over here. He's a truthful man. Dan's a truthful guy. But God calls Jonah to arise and, goes to, and go to a city called Nineveh. It is described as that great city, and he is told to cry against it. In other words, prophesy against it because of their wickedness. Now, something you might need to know about Nineveh, in the day that we're talking about here, it was the largest city in the known world at that time. It was a great seaport, and it also was an enemy to Israel. Israel cared nothing for Nineveh. They did not like Israel, and Israel did not like the people there. And the people of Nineveh, guess what? They were not Israelites. They were Gentiles. They were Gentile. So when Jonah hears that God is telling him to go uh, do this great uh, crying against this city, what does he do? He ignores the call. And he decided it was time to take a vacation, Brother Bill. Amen? Time to take a vacation. So he takes off in the opposite direction that God wanted him to go. And uh, from there, I just already see a whole bunch of sermons coming in line. Amen? And you know what, though? Uh, I, Jonah went in the opposite direction. I have witnessed plenty of people going in the opposite direction of what God wanted them to go in. Yeah. Amen. Well, you know, today, the children of disobedience, the people that are not saved, they're going in the opposite direction of what God wants them to go. It would, uh, it, I would to God that all people would come to the knowledge, saving knowledge of Jesus. Amen. And that's what God wants. That's the heart of God. He wants all to be saved. But uh, I want you to notice also that Jonah, even though, he has gone in the opposite direction even though he has been disobedient to God. He is still called God's prophet. Amen. You and I, we mess up daily. Amen. Yeah. You and I, we mess up daily. Amen. Amen. But God still claims us as his own, doesn't Amen. he? Amen. But uh, if you look at Jonah, you can do like he did. You can take your advice from Jonah if you want to. But you need to see what happened to Jonah. Things just didn't quite work out well for him, amen? And if you go in the opposite direction of what God wants you to go, things just ain't going to work, and that's plain English, things just ain't going to work out for you, amen? Things are not going to work out good for you. You're, there will be circumstances to pay for. So what am I saying? You can be saved and you can be miserable all at the same time because of you operating in your own strength instead of operating in the strength of God. I believe it's a good thing when God speaks to us through his word. He impresses our hearts by his Holy Spirit. Well, you heard a testimony from our pastor friend, Brother Bill, how that God spoke to his heart that the church was done looking. Amen? And I experienced something very similar to that. I knew that uh, cathedral prayer was not going to be shopping for a pastor because of what God had spoke to me about and what God had spoke to our founding pastor about at the same time. That's Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I believe it's a good thing when God speaks to us through his word. When those times happen, you know what? We are just better off doing what God is impressing us to do. Not long ago, Brother Mike over here was in the hospital, and Ray and I, Brother Ray and I, we went to go see him. 
And we prayed with him and we gave him his last rites. And uh, after we confirmed that we were included in his will, we left him there. We left him there in a the hospital in sackcloth and ashes as he was confessing his, his sins all the way. <laughs> and after we left uh, his room, Ray and I, we went and pushed a button there on the elevator and we're waiting. And we, you remember this? We look across the room and there's a group of people across the room and they're all huddled, arms around each other, and they're all praying. Well, the elevator came and we went down and we left. Later that day, Ray sent me a text asking if he could borrow $100. And not really, I'm just kidding. He sent me a text message, and it was about something. We were, you know, probably fishing on some words or something like that. But anyway, he included in that text message, he says, uh, I felt a nudge to go and pray with that group of people earlier that day. When I read that, man, I was blown away because I had felt the same prompting to do so. But neither one of us said anything to each other and we got on the elevator and we left. We have no idea what they was praying about that day. But what we concluded is that both of us probably missed out on a blessing. We probably missed out on a blessing. And somehow, either through praying with them or just meeting some other like-minded believers uh, that serve the same God we do, we probably just missed a huge blessing. Amen? We both are preachers. We both are preachers. And it could be that maybe God would have impressed our heart. And, and I just have to say, I think he was going to impress our heart to say something to them since we both felt that prompting to go. Yeah. Amen? So, anyway, we missed a blessing that day. I would just encourage you today, don't miss the promptings. Don't ignore the promptings from God. Because listen to me, you may think just because uh, Pastor Tim's up here on the platform, he's a pastor, well, he's just all, he's all good with that. He's in line that that's going to happen to him. Well, let me tell you something. You're born again. You're a child of God. You're a brand new creation, and God is going to prompt you too. Amen? I might as well just warn you about it right now. So when he does, don't miss the blessing. Don't ignore the call from God like we're seeing in our story of Jonah. You know, things are just about to get miserable for Jonah right now. He buys himself a ticket, and he boards a ship, and he heads for a city called Tarshish. His purpose, now listen to this, his purpose is to flee the presence of the Lord. Now that statement can be a little bit misleading if you're not paying attention. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? Nobody is going to uh, escape the omnipresence presence of God. Amen? You, no matter where you go, what deepest cavern that you may try to hide yourself in, spiritually where you may try to hide from God, God knows where you're at today. And I'm glad that there was a day that God knew my address. Amen? And God called me out from it. Amen? Amen. But listen to me. What this means is, is, is that Jonah, well, he wanted to escape. He wanted to flee from Israel because that's where God was in the temple and he was wanting to flee Israel and go to a place where God wasn't around. Yeah. Woo! Man, that's dangerous living in my, in my opinion. Amen? Here's a prophet trying to escape God's call. And so we see, we see from this, and this was amazing to me when the Holy Spirit pointed this out, God is concerned about a Gentile nation that's living in wickedness. Now, we really don't see the Gentiles coming in, being grafted in until the age of the new covenant where we're at today. Yeah. But all way, way back yonder, there in, in, in Nineveh, in the Old Testament, during the times of the Old Covenant, God is still concerned about Gentile people. You know why? Because it's always been God's plan to bring the Gentiles in. Amen. Woo! Amen! I'm a Gentile. I've been grafted in. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know why we're all not up here jumping down and kicking our shoes off. Amen? Amen? But God is concerned about the wickedness of these heathen nations. I told you who's living in Nineveh. It's the Gentiles. We can lift our hands and we can praise God today because in times past, ladies and gentlemen, we learn in the book of Ephesians that the Gentiles had no hope. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. But now because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we've been brought in by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no other way you'll be brought in except by the blood. So Jonah, 
boards this ship. But God, God's involved here. God sends a wind and the ship is being tossed to and fro. Now the crew is tossing out all the cargo. And you know, here's something interesting. This is how important we think our lives are. This crew on this ship, they are, they are transporting goods from one country to another. And so when the storm comes up and the ship is being tossed to and fro, they're afraid for their lives. And what do they do? They start taking the cargo, dumping it off. My life is just a little bit more important than delivering cargo. Amen. I'd rather live without a payday than to die with a payday. Amen. Yeah. Amen? So they're dumping stuff overboard. And the Bible said the crew, now get this, the crew uh, which was made up of Gentiles, they're all calling upon their individual gods. I got an idea there were different Gentile nations represented on this ship and uh, they're all calling on their gods. And if you read the word of God in the Bible, it's little g, yeah. little g gods. Little G gods uh, are gods who are asleep, amen. These little G gods, they have no power. These little G gods are idol gods made of wood, hay, and stubble, amen. So what happens is the captain of the ship, he goes down into the hull and he sees this fella down there, he's asleep. Now, we got to look at Jonah for just a minute. He's not a shipmate. He's under no obligation to be up there helping him throw stuff off the ship. He bought a ticket. He's there for the ride, amen. And he's just down there asleep. And the shipmaster goes down and says, Oh, sleeper, what's going on with you? <laughs> he said, Call upon your God and see if he will help us. If you notice in the word, in the word in your Bible here, that, that G is a capital G. Amen. I think they had tried all of the little G gods and they was getting nothing out of them. Now you know what? There's nothing said in the word of God that Jonah prayed. He didn't pray right there. He does pray later but not right there. So maybe he did. I don't know. But I think what we have here is what the Holy Spirit wanted us to see in the scripture. Amen. But uh, they were all Gentiles. They all had their gods. But when Jonah, when they approached Jonah, they tell him to pray to his God. And so he goes, uh, the, the crew comes down and they say, we got to figure out what's going on here. Why is all this happening to us? Let's, uh, let's get everybody around here and let's cast lots. Now, if I don't know how much you know about casting lots, but it's kind of similar to how we would draw straws today. Amen? Whoever got the short straw, that means that, that's on you. Amen? So they cast these lots, and these lots, they fell toward Jonah, and then the crew, I can just all see them turning their heads real slow, what in the world have you done to bring all of this on us? Amen. Where are you from, by the way? What, what part of Kentucky are you from? Amen. And uh, they want to know, what did you do to offend God? Would you pray to him and ask him not to destroy us? Because why, why, why are they having this conversation? Because Jonah revealed to them that he had run from God's command. Now, all of these Gentiles on board, they're getting an idea who the real God is. Amen? He's the one that created the land and the sea. He's the one that's brought this wind up. They said, well, well, what should we do with you? Jonah says, you cast me overboard, the wind will stop and the sea will cease. You know what happened next? Get this. The ship's crew, they began to row toward the shore. Jonah told them what to do. And the wind is pressing against them. You know what they discovered? They ain't going anywhere. That reminded me of people that try to get to heaven by their own works. You ain't going anywhere but one direction, buddy, and that is hellfire. Amen. You better put the oar down and start trusting Jesus Christ. Amen. As your Lord and Savior. So, but I get the feeling though, I'm not being really too critical on these guys. They're all Gentiles. They were heathen. But you know what? They realized the value of a person's life. They did not want to throw him overboard. They would rather try to save his life if they could. But you know what? They realized that their works were useless. And then the Bible says they cried out to the God of Israel. I kind of believe that these fellows on board all became believers. I just believe that. So I think it's good when we finally realize we cannot work on our own. That is a great day. Amen. That's a great day. So 
they said this. They prayed to the Lord and they said, please don't let us die because of this one man and please don't lay on us innocent blood. Lord, we know you have done as it has pleased you. They throw Jonah overboard and guess what? Suddenly the wind stops and the waves are calm. Like I said, I believe when they saw that miracle, I think those fellows started bowing their hearts and saying, God, would you save me? Would you save me? Now we get to the part where God has prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Three days and nights he's in the belly of this fish. And then the Bible says, then Jonah prayed. How many of us have waited till we got inside the belly of the big fish and said, God, I wish I'd have said something to you earlier. God, you know where I'm at right now? It is pitch dark in here. I don't even have a cell phone with a light on it so I can see what's going on. And God, I, I, I think those are ribs I feel. I hear something going boom, 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 boom. Man, that pounding's getting on my nerves. There's a big old heart in there, amen. That Jonah is in the belly of this fish. You're looking at me like this is the first time you heard this story. Amen. <laughs> like I've got an eight-year-old right here. Amen. But anyway, he's in the belly of this fish. And the Bible says, then Jonah prayed. All right, here's a whole list of new sermons I guess we could preach from. Amen. But you know what happened? I'm not going to give you the whole story. But eventually, God causes the fish to vomit Jonah up onto dry land. In chapter number three, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. <laughs> he says, Arise and go to Nineveh and preach against it. The Bible said that Nineveh was a great city. Can I remind you again who's living in Nineveh? Who is it? Gentiles. Gentiles, that's exactly right. Gentiles, and these Gentiles are actually a threat to the nation of Israel. So can you kind of understand, work with me for just a minute, can you kind of understand Jonah's feeling toward these people, they don't like me. They would like to destroy my country. I don't really like them, but you're telling me to go talk to them about you. Do you understand his dilemma here? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So, how many of us have felt that way before about somebody we didn't particularly like, but, oh, I hear the groans out there. Amen, I must have hit a nerve today. <laughs> well, Amen. He's going to a heathen nation that doesn't like Israel. So you can kind of see what's going on. Now we get to the part with Jonah. The Bible says Jonah enters the city. And I can just see him walking all up and down the streets preaching loud. You have 40 days before God's going to kill all of you. Amen? 40 days and God's going to destroy you. All of a sudden, this gets people's attention. What did he say? Shh, listen, 40, 40 days. Forty days God is going to kill us? Man, you got to be kidding. No, he's not kidding. He's very serious. Wait a minute. That guy's not even from here. He's an Israelite. Ooh, we've heard about the God of Israel, how he parted the sea and how he did all these things in the world. That guy must be telling, this man must be sent from God. You know what those people did? Those silly bunch of people, they believed God. They believed, everybody say, believed God. They believed God and they began to repent of their sin. Then you know what happens? Word gets up to the king sitting on his throne. And the king said, say what? There's a guy out there preaching 40 days we're going to die because God, because all the, yeah, the king knows about all the wickedness going on because he's in charge of it, amen? Just like some of ours today. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the king, he decides to believe God and he repents, and he wears sackcloth and ashes. Now sackcloth in the Bible uh, represents, uh, represents people repenting or being in submission in, uh, or being in times of sorrow. And when you put on sackcloth and ashes, wearing ashes was a sign that you're repenting of sin, just like Brother Mike was doing there in the hospital. So I'm just a kidding with him now. So the king put out a decree. Listen to the decree now. The king says, all right, everybody in Nineveh, listen to me. I want everybody to fast and don't even feed your livestock either. They're going to fast with us and we're going to pray that God will change his mind. That's what repentance is, by the way. Repentance is a change of mind. A cha everybody say a change of mind. 
That's what repentance is. So the Bible said that God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented. Even God changed his mind, amen? And he's now not going to bring any destruction to Nineveh. When we come to chapter 4, the Bible opens this chapter by saying, Jonah was exceedingly displeased and angry. Whoo, man, things just changed here all of a sudden. Jonah is commissioned by God to go preach. He says, I'm not going to. I'm going this way. He gets thrown off of a boat in the belly of a fish, vomited back up on the, to the uh, uh, sea, uh, into the beach there. Then he goes and preaches, and he's so proud of himself, his chest busting off the buttons. Y'all going to die in 40 days. No, he ain't. Dear God, save us. Amen. That makes him fired up, angry, mad. They repented. They believed God. Does that make any sense? You ever been aggravated because somebody got saved? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Jonah's thinking this. I came, I came all this way by means, God, of you bugging me about preaching this to this evil people. And then I was tossed overboard into a raging sea. And then I was living in a fish's belly. And then he vomited me up. I come here preaching. You tell me to give the warning that these evil, nasty, heathen Gentiles uh, are going to suffer destruction only to see nothing happened after all. How many preachers, how many preachers have been disappointed because, oh, we just knew this is what God wanted for our church. We knew God wanted us to have this building or this land or all these buses and all this, all this, all these things only to find out God said, I am not in that at all. And then disappointment happens. Amen. And then we all get mad and upset with God. Well, uh, I must not be doing what God wants me to do. No. Well, maybe not. Just stick to preaching. Amen. Just stick to preaching. That's a good thing to do. Anyway, Jonah says, God, what's the deal? What's the deal? Now, let's all remember for just a minute, Jonah didn't like these people. But he's a prophet. <laughs> And maybe he's worried about losing his reputation as a prophet because you know what happens when a prophet prophesies and it, that prophecy does not materialize, it's goodbye head and shoulders, amen? Did you know that there are some people that would rather see destruction than the grace of God? Now, I want you to follow me here. There are some that would rather see destruction come than seeing the grace of God. Jonah has lost complete control of himself. He is angry. He's mad because his preaching about destruction did not come to pass. Hey, listen to me. I'll be honest with you. Every preacher wants to be right. We want to be right what we say. Amen. I want to be right about this message today and the one last week and the week before. All of us do. Amen. So he's upset that it didn't come to pass. While Jonah was mad, Perhaps he's thinking, God, you didn't do what you said you was going to be doing. These heathen people, they repented and they believed you. You must have not seen that coming, right, God? Hmm. Do you think maybe Jonah has got the wrong perspective about what's happening? I do. You want to know something that's very interesting about this? If you read in Jonah chapter 4 and verse number 2, you're going to realize that Jonah already knew that this could happen. Look what he said. He said, Lord, didn't I say when I was still in my country or in Israel that I knew you are a gracious God, a merciful God, that you're slow to anger and a great kindness? Jonah knew these things about God already. He knew these things about God, being a gracious God, a merciful God, a long-suffering God, a God that was slow to anger and of great kindness. That just touches me. We have a God of great kindness, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. And Jonah admits, God, I knew these things about you. He knew that if he preached to these Ninevites, if they believed, he knew that God would forgive them. And I think that could be part of the reason why he was running. He did. He despised them so terribly bad. He didn't want them to hear the gospel, did he? Honestly, he didn't want them to repent. But at this point, I think in Jonah's life, he preferred destruction on them because they were evil Gentiles and they were a threat to his home country, Israel. But God, 
is the merciful God to all people of the world, ladies and gentlemen. First Timothy two tells us, "For this is a is a uh, good and accept this is for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge." of the truth. 2 Peter 3 tells us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? Amen. Several years ago, I went to a gospel scene. And uh, this gospel scene was being held at a restaurant where you could buy your food and you could enjoy your food while you're listening to gospel singers. Well, I went to this singing one night and uh, I saw this fellow that I knew, and uh, we got to talking, renewing an, an acquaintance. And I said something about, well, I see you guys are in a different location now than what you have been. And he goes, <laughs> yeah, he said, let me tell you about that. He said, we was over there at so-and-so restaurant. We'd been there for years, and then they got this new manager in there. And she come in there, and she didn't like this gospel singing, and so she put an end to all of it, and so we had to move. He says, let me tell you something. About three weeks later, she just up and died. He said, God took care of that. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, that is horrible. You know what's horrible about that? As he chuckled at the fact there's a possibility that this lady could be screaming in hell right now. Some people would rather see destruction than the grace of God. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing ever funny about a person being in hell. You know what? I got to thinking about that just yesterday. I was thinking, you know what? She could have very well been a saved, born-again person, but maybe just not the kind of person that goes around telling everybody, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Yeah. I like to witness, but there are some people that are kind of ridiculous about it. And those kind of people, they don't really get much of a following. They don't really win a lot of souls because most of the time people think they're kind of nuts. There's a possibility this lady could have been a born-again believer, but maybe because she listened to her clientele who was also eating at the same restaurant, maybe they preferred not to have the noise in the background. Maybe she decided it would be better off to please my clientele. It wasn't necessary to have the gospel sing there. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to be reasonable about these things, ladies and gentlemen. You have to use your head. And you know what? I decided this. If you'll use your head, you'll probably win more people to Jesus than when you're not using your head. Amen? Uh, some people would rather see destruction instead of grace. Remember the two brothers in Luke chapter 15? One said, Daddy, give me everything that's in my inheritance. And he got it, and he took it now, and he went out and spent it until he had nothing, and he was about to die of starvation. Then he goes home to Dad, and Dad welcomes him back home with joy and affection, and he restores to him everything he had, that he had, uh, had left behind. That's the demonstration of grace and mercy and kindness. Amen? But then the brother comes in from the field and says, what's all that music going on in there? What's going on? You mean my brother came back home? Uh, well, uh, uh, I've been here all this time and you never treated me that way. See, he would have rather kept his brother out living a life of destruction and ended up dying of starvation than to welcome him back home and having joy about it. Amen. Some people are just geared for, I'd rather see somebody suffer than to enjoy the grace of God. Here's something we need to understand. Jonah had received grace and mercy and long suffering and great kindness from God, but he forgot all about it when it came to the lives of those Gentiles in Nineveh, didn't he? Oh, this kind of makes me think that, Tim, maybe you ought to offer what you have been given. Maybe I need to offer to people what I've been given. I've been offered grace and mercy and kindness from God. God could have easily said, Jonah, you disobedient prophet, I'm going to destroy you for not doing what I commanded you. But God did something different, didn't he? God demonstrated his love toward Jonah. God spared his life from the raging sea. And God prepared a specialty type fish to take Jonah on a three-day, three-night, all-expenses-paid sea cruise to the depths of the sea. Amen? <laughs> Jonah got down there where he could be finally alone with God in a dark place where he could only hear the voice of God. Amen? So the, I wonder what that conversation was like. Well, <laughs> here's what it was. Jonah began to pray. He said, with the voice 
of thanksgiving I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. You know, I've reflected many times on my journey with God, and I've thought about those early years in my preaching ministry when I preached destruction. I preached destruction to born-again believers. You better straighten up. Get right with God. Your heart's wicked. You've been doing things you shouldn't be done. You, 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 you. Barking out orders like I was really in charge. And uh, talking so mean and hateful about to lost people that they're headed for destruction, and they are headed for destruction but they need to be told in the spirit of kindness and mercy and grace and long-suffering and what a loving Father that we really have. Amen? <laughs> I'm so glad God loves me. Because listen, ladies and gentlemen, I still mess up every single day that I'm living on this earth. And God says, Tim, I still love you. Tim, you're still my favorite. How do you like that? Tim, you're still my favorite. I love you, son. Amen. I'm, I, I'm the disciple Jesus loves. Amen? <laughs> My name's not even John. He said, Lord, salvation is of the Lord. As I said in last week's message, I've learned to be more compassionate now. I see God as ever more gracious than I've ever known before. He's loving, He's good, He's kind, and it's not His will that any should perish. Jonah goes to town and he preaches just as he knew that it was possible it could happen. The people make a change and God changes his mind about the destruction. Now get this. Jonah, he leaves town mad. He goes and builds him a little, a little hut. And he says, God, why don't you just take my life? Just don't even let me live. I think Jonah's upset now because he realizes that he did not keep his bargain about having a voice of thanksgiving for sparing Nineveh. That the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents. What do you think we ought to be doing? Woo-hoo! Amen! Another one just got saved. Yeah. Glory to God. You know what? I discovered there were people who were glad that I got saved. And other people were like, yeah, okay. And other people were like, well, you know, what's it going to be? Is it going to be our friendship or is it going to be that church group over there? So you had it coming at, at me from all sides. Did you ever have to go through any of that? I'm sure some of you have. Amen. So Jonah goes, builds a hut, says, take my life. He didn't give God the voice of thanksgiving. He's mad. Then God does something else for Jonah. The Bible said, <laughs> I had to laugh over this. God said, Jonah, hey, hey, Joe, is it doing you any good to be angry? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine God just asking this question? Is it doing you any good to be angry? I remember I, t I was told a story <clears throat> about these two fellows that got in this big argument at work. And they're just nose to nose and toes to toes. And they're going at it for like five minutes and one of them just smiles. And the other one says, what are you smiling about? He says, I bet you don't even know what we're arguing about now, do you? <laughs> they both had a good laugh and shook hands over it. Amen? Some people are not happy unless they're just angry. Amen? That's an oxymoron, but it's true. Some people are not happy unless they're angry, and most of the time it's just over silly stuff, isn't it? Hmm. Jonah leaves town. He makes this hut for himself. He sits down. He's going to see what's going to happen to Nineveh now. But then God did something else. He prepared a gourd to come up over Jonah, and it covered his head from the sun. And Jonah, the Bible says he was glad for the shade. But you know what? God also prepared a worm to eat up that gourd. And in just a matter of time, the worm eats up the gourd. Now the sun comes down beating. The east wind's coming. It's hitting Jonah. It knocks him out. I mean, it, it slays him. He, he's passed out. He gets up. He's upset. God said, Jonah, are you mad that the gourd is dead and then able to give you shade? Jonah, can I remind you of something? You didn't plant it. You didn't care for it. You didn't water it. You didn't prune it. You did nothing. But now you have pity on it because it died. Then God says, Jonah, listen to me. In Nineveh, there's 120,000 people. that they, they are so wicked and evil. They cannot even tell their left hand from their right hand. And you don't think I should have spared them. It seems like that God is showing Jonah that Jonah had a higher concern for a plant with no soul than he did for a people with eternal souls. Jonah was more interested in 120,000 people being destroyed more than experiencing them experiencing grace and mercy and the kindness of God.
Romans chapter 2 tells us the goodness of God leads men to repentance. So what's this whole message about? There are those that have experienced grace and mercy and goodness and kindness of God, but yet they would rather refuse it to others. The fact is, everyone who is truly born again has experienced the grace, mercy, goodness, and kindness of God. What we have received is what we need to offer those who are lost and those who have gone astray. I had a fellow tell me yesterday, you'll get to meet him pretty soon. He said 10 years ago he put a gun to his head going to take his life and he heard a voice say, don't do it. He put the gun down. He decided to go to a church, but before he went in, he got drunk. And he went into the church. They realized he was drunk. And he said, you know what that church did to me? They loved me. They loved on me. He said, man, that changed my whole perspective about church and about God's people. He said, today, <laughs> 10 years later, God has blessed me with a ministry that is just taken off and blessing people, and we're being blessed. He said he was riding down the highway with a friend on their Harleys one day. They was out west somewhere, and they driving by, and they see this girl walking down this lonely, desolate highway wearing a tank top and some, some kind of pants or whatever. And they drove down the road. They went to this gas station. He looks at his buddy. He says, you see that girl back here? He says, yeah. He says, did you sense anything? He says, yeah, we should have stopped. He said, I felt the same way. It's prompting. They go back. She's sitting down on a rock right next to a cemetery there. He walks up and says, hey, baby girl, what's going on? She goes, well, I'm getting ready to kill myself. He says, no, you're not. She goes, yes, I am. He goes, no, you're not. Yes, I am. He said, I just reached over, and he says, I got her, and I drawed her into me. He says, I'm not letting you go until you tell me, no, you're not. <laughs> he said, baby girl, what are you doing here? She says, I'm going to kill myself. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. And then she got quiet. He said, what's going on? She goes, I ain't going to kill myself. What would have happened if they're not going back? What would have happened? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it breaks my heart today that the grace of God is not being preached in every pulpit. I didn't say some pulpits. I didn't say for some denominations. I'm saying the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the long-suffering of God ought to be the main focus of every sermon every week in every church house because people need to be loved to God. Amen. Who's going through a problem today? Well, all of us have got something going on, and we need the long-suffering and, and, and the love and the care of God. Amen? Boy, you know that's really all we know about Jonah? The, the only, I guess we could say the only other thing we know about Jonah is that Jesus verifies his story in the New Testament, how he was in the, the belly of the fish for three days and nights. So we know it's a true story. Amen? Yes. I wonder who needs the grace. Thank you.